Welcome back. This is your professor, Dr. Magda Alzanowski. And before we begin, some joyful food for thought in regards to our class. In a 2005 paper entitled, Cinema is Good for You, the Effects of Cinema Attendance on Self-Reported Anxiety and Depression and Happiness. Quite a title. The author finds that, and I quote, the unique properties of attending the cinema can have positive effects on mental well-being because visual stimulation can cue a range of emotions and the collective experience of these emotions through the cinema provides a safe environment in which to experience roles and emotions we might not otherwise be free to experience. We'll discuss that more later. Further, the cinema is unique in that it is a highly accessible social art form. The participation generally cuts across economic lines. In other words, cinema is fun, good fun, a learning activity, and therapeutic all at the same time. And if you can believe it, in a rather groundbreaking study from the year 2000, it was found frequent cinema attendees have particularly low mortality risks. Those who never attended the cinema have mortality rates nearly four times higher than those who visit the cinema at least occasionally. Now, so while we cannot attend a cinema like we used to, I'm happily here with you to make sure you watch a lot of movies at home or wherever you watch them. So let's begin. This week's class will have its first part in the lecture that you're watching, which provides you some critical reflection questions alongside your reading. Then our class will be spent on more interactive formal and cultural analysis. The movies. Born in 1981, they flourished for a long time, yet there have always been those who believe that the movies were a passing fancy, a fad, a poor cousin of more traditional arts like literature, painting, architecture, dance, and music. Film studies departments only kind of started coming into fruition in the 1970s and 80s, and even later. Cinema, the big word, comes from the Greek kinesis, movement. And the name originates from the name French inventors and pioneer manufacturers of photographic equipment who devised an early motion picture camera and projector called the cinematograph the Lumiere brothers, coined this for the hall where they exhibited their invention. So the hall where they exhibited this early motion picture camera was cinema. We still call it that name, right? And the brothers also made the first motion picture, right? First picture in motion. The workers leaving the Lumiere factory in 1895. Pretty wild, right? The first moving picture was about workers, wasn't about fancy, wealthy people that never have to work and only gain more power and wealth by oppressing others. Pretty important, ordinary citizens. So I'll let you watch the last couple of minutes of it. couple more cinema terms. Why do we call these images, these motion pictures, a film? Well, film derives from the celluloid strip on which images that make up the motion pictures were originally captured, cut, and projected. If you've ever seen a kind of analog uh, film reel from your camera, it's very similar. And movies is simply short for motion pictures. So no matter what you call it, no matter the approach, the format, every movie is a motion picture. It's a series of still images that when viewed in rapid succession, 24 images per second or 30, the human eye and brain see it as fluid movement. In other words, movies move. So here we have an animated GIF of a sequence shot by Moybridge in 1887, right? So he took many, many images and when you're watching them in fast succession, looks like a movie. Pretty cool. Stop motion animation. It's one sort of precursor. Now, what does it mean to analyze films? The goal of this class is to help you develop a vocabulary and some tools for critical thinking and to facilitate the critical analysis of any film that you see, whether it aims to be a work of entertainment, a work of art, or both. 
Now, as a first step in that process, let's consider the bigger picture. Cultural analysis. The bigger picture is everything around us, the world, our location, our geography, the people around us, what's happening right now, politically, who we identify as. This is what makes up culture. And we will consider all these contexts when we do our cultural studies approach to the study of film. It would be disingenuous, disingenuous to do this class during a pandemic, a climate crisis, and a war by police against Black people with and all the other shit going on. There's no room for vacuum learning in 2020. But to critique all of these things within cinema culture, we also need to do formal analysis. Whoa, here we go. What's formal analysis? So I'll read it out, but here it is for you. Formal analysis dissects the complex synthesis of cinematography, sound, composition, design, movement, performance, and editing. All we'll explain later. All these orchestrated by creative artists like screenwriters, directors, cinematographers, actors, editors, sound designers, as well as many craftspeople who implement their vision. The movie meaning expressed through form ranges from narrative information as straightforward as where and where, when a particular scene takes place, so what location, time frame, to more subtle implied meanings such as mood, tone, significance, or certain feelings of a character. And we'll explore all this. And to note, especially for this class, is that cultural differences often affect exactly how stories are presented. So what the director's identity is, at what time and place they're making the movie, who they are, but also how we interpret those stories and their formal elements, right? So we may think, oh, it's a close-up shot of an image, straightforward, but actually how we present a close-up shot of a face or maybe the colors the character is wearing or all other things, we interpret it differently because of who we are, where we come from, what language we speak, what histories we have, right? How we find certain movies funny and the person sitting next to us in the same time and place doesn't find it funny at all, finds it maybe offensive or stupid. Now, when we get to all of these things and we're thinking about them, how do we think about them? It's through cinematic language. And this was formed by early fam filmmakers to help guide the audience. And it's not composed of words, but of rather various integrated techniques and concepts that connect us to the story while deliberately concealing the means which it does so, such as the technique of fade to black in a film, as you see here. It's used to symbolize completion, meaning a narrative of thought is finished. The audience assume that time has passed, and we assume this through exactly cinematic language. Otherwise, there's nothing about a fade to black that means directly this. A fade to white also means something different. So cinematic language is a kind of specialized vocabulary for describing, analyzing, discussing, writing about, and making movies. Once you learn to know the cinematic language, you'll be equipped to understand the movies that pervade our world on multiple levels, as narrative, as artistic expression, and most importantly, as a reflection of the culture that produces and consumes it. Now, the description of form, let's get back to form, I've mentioned it a few times, sort of really abstract. So let's draw some examples from one movie that many people have seen and that is discussed in your book. The Wizard of Oz, the viewer, the audience can notice many particular elements. There is most obviously a set of narrative elements, and these are what constitutes the film story. And usually when we're doing analysis or we're describing a movie, we're doing this, we're talking about the story. Right? Dorothy dreams that a tornado blows her to Oz. She has adventures. The narrative continues to the point where Dorothy awakens from her dream and finds herself back home in Kansas. Now, that's all good and all. But what we're going to try to do in this class is pick about some stylistic formal elements, right? So the way the camera moves, the patterns of colors, music, and other devices. And these elements use various film techniques that we'll consider later in the course and your chapters explain them too. And to consider that a film is not a hodgepodge, right? Wizard of Oz is not a hodgepodge, it didn't just happen. It's a system, 
A film is a system, and we actively relate the elements within each set to another. We link and compare narrative elements, right? So in this instance, we see the tornado as causing Dorothy's trip to Oz. We identify the characters in Oz as similar to characters in Dorothy's Kansas life. Various stylistic elements can also be connected. For instance, we recognize that we're off to see the wizard, the wonderful, oof. We recognize this tune whenever Dorothy picks up a new companion. We attribute unity to the film by positing two organizing principles. Remember I said them earlier, the narrative one and the stylistic one, and they work together within the system of the film. Moreover, our minds seek to tie these systems together. We do this as an audience. In The Wizard of Oz, the narrative development can be linked to stylistic patterning, for instance. Colors identify prominent landmarks, such as Kansas is in black and white, and the yellow brick road and the incredibly saturated colors uh, where she's off to Oz. Movements of the camera call our attention to story action, and the music serves to describe certain characters and situations. So we see a pattern of relationships forming within the system and not just the story, but they are in conjunction with the story. Two other elements that I want to mention are patterns and motif. So more subtly throughout any film, we can observe repetitions of everything, lines of dialogue, right? A repetition of a phrase, certain music playing at certain times, certain kinds of music, camera positions, story action. And it's useful to have a term to describe these formal repetitions. And the two most common are patterns and motifs, as I mentioned. So a motif is any significant element repeated in a film. It may be an object, a color, a place, a person, a sound, or even a character trait. Now, we may also call a pattern of lighting or camera position a motif if it's repeated many, many times, right? So something, a kind of object that's repeated many, many times and has a significance. And then when we're thinking about patterns, so go back to Wizard of Oz again, we see similarities between Kansas and Oz, right? The three Kansas farmhands and the scarecrow, Tin Man, and Cowardly Lion, We notice additional echoes between characters in the frame story and the fantasy. The duplication is not exact, but the similarity is strong enough that we can connect it. And these similarities are called parallelism, which is a kind of pattern. So it allows us to be cued to compare certain elements in the film, and that kind of makes up the system and brings us into the story world. It's not just chaos, even if maybe the story is a bit chaotic. And so to recap, form is the sum of all the parts of the film unified and given shape by patterns such as repetition, storylines, character traits. And style is the way a film uses the techniques of filmmaking. And so we can really see the way that Wes Anderson takes seemingly very kind of basic formal elements, but adds a style to it. So it's the way that the director uses the techniques of filmmaking. And I find this really useful, right? Because he's using certain kinds of shots we can all learn, but though it's the way he uses them or the way he uses character types, as you see here. So you can kind of see and follow along. So while we can't really hear what they're saying, we imagine usually the kind of uh, men in his films are usually kind of silly. They're a bit immature, right? Well, we see it right here, wearing certain kinds of clothes, right? You really see the kind of character types that are happening if you've seen a bunch of his films. And this one, shots and angles. 
So right, using slow motion, that's a common thing that he uses to emphasize certain things, right? Something important uh, about to happen. By using slow motion, it really emphasizes, takes time. It kind of also breaks us out of the story world as much. I'm here from Royal Tenenbaums. bird's eye view so that's a kind of angle we'll look at right which is literally the bird's eye view so how a bird would see a scene he has pans and tilts right so kind of super fast again disorienting uh, the viewer certain kinds of shots like tracking that he uses many times over And you see a tracking shot is where, well, we skipped ahead, uh, is when a camera is sort of moving alongside and moving along the character, right? So it's moving and the character is moving. And we'll skip ahead, but you can watch the rest. So when we're thinking about the way Wes Anderson especially has a very unique style. So to go back we're, when we're watching movies, Right, so we have these formal and stylistic elements and they allow us to think a certain way about the film, about ourselves, about our relationship to the film. And here I wanted to mention two key processes that characterize our, our reception of films. They're identification and idealization. So identification um, is a kind of mode of engagement with film content. Something in the film reminds us of our own experience. And we tend to identify with the relevant character and their situation. This is especially relevant when we think about who is predominantly on the screen and how it's important for us to see ourselves reflected back, not just as stereotypes, especially for not white, cisgendered, able-bodied people, we usually are stereotypes. And so one example I wanted to show for you is, um, while it's not cinema in some ways, I think it is, is Issa Rae's first series. The Misadventures of Awkward Black Girl. Am I the only one who pretends I'm in a music video when I'm by myself? Awkward moment. What's the protocol for repeatedly running into someone at a stop sign? Oh my god, hey, I totally didn't even it's see been you. It's so long. I, I know, right? No, seriously, no, seriously. What, the seriously. what the fuck is it? Well, I guess I'll see you at work. <laughs> are you supposed to acknowledge them every time? And how many fake laughs are acceptable before it becomes too much? <laughs> no, I, I saw you. Like, I know. <laughs> is it rude to do the dramatic slowdown? Or what about the fake phone call? There's only so long I can hold a fake conversation. No, I'm told, yeah, nope, yeah. The stop sign. To any ordinary person, it's a simple sign of direction. But for me, it's the epitome of social misdirection because I'm awkward. Oh, fuck, another fucking stop sign? Are you shitting me? Are you shitting me? <laughs> You're hilarious. Oh my gosh. Oh, yes. another stop sign. Let's talk at work, right? <laughs> Let me introduce myself. My name is Jay, and I'm awkward and black. Someone once told me those were the two worst things anyone could be. That someone was right. Where do I start? Three months ago, I shaved my head. My boyfriend, D, the only guy I've ever loved, had just broken up with me. You know what? I can't do this no more. I can't. I'm not happy. I'm uncomfortable. I don't even think you're happy. I, I just, I gotta go. So I needed a fresh start. And to me, a fresh start meant crying in the mirror, cutting all my hair, getting drunk at the company holiday party, and sleeping with this guy, A, my coworker. 
Two days later, D said he wanted to give it another shot. I gave it some thoughts. I don't want to make this work. But my new lack of hair made him feel like less of a man. And a week later, he broke up with me. I feel gay. No homo. But I can't do this. So now, here I am writing violent rap lyrics in my bedroom. Bitch nigga, you's a liar. I'll set your face on fire. I don't give a fuck. Stupid bitch nigga, I hope you drown. That'll turn my frown upside down. I'm a bad bitch. You're a pussy nigga. What the fuck rhymes with pussy nigga? Yes, you deserve to die, and I hope you burn in hell, nigga. Burn in hell, nigga. Burn in, burn in hell, nigga. It's been my secret way of coping with stress since sixth grade. It gets me through my job, my relationships, and my life. It's odd, but what can I say? I'm awkward. My booty shop, booty shop, bouncing in my booty shop, booty shop, popping in my booty shop, booty shop, my booty shop, booty shop. Incredibly funny and one of the best things I've ever seen. If you're looking for a completely different sort of cinema, if you will, experience. Now, so we have identification. I don't necessarily identify with Issa Rae, but somewhat maybe more than certain projections of uh, people in the world. So we have identification. And then, so unlike a brilliant, 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 awkward black girl, girl, classical Hollywood cinema loves and needs us to uncritically enact idealization, a mode of engagement with film content. Something in the film resonates with our dreams and aspirations. If only our lives were quite like this. Now, of course, it's totally okay to engage in idealization, especially in COVID times where you can't do much. And am I going on a cross-country trip with friends and lovers and no masks on? Surely not. So when I watch Y Tu Mama Tambien, I can. So here, that was a clip. But it becomes a problem when we do this so much we lose sight of who we are and project onto the Hollywood consumerist machine and their stifled paradigms. Another scene uh, from the film. All right, so here we are, cross country trip, finds the beach, wow. So, now, you may have noticed that some films are more difficult to get into than others. Maybe you dislike them and you're not sure why because they're critically acclaimed, but you still feel this way. Or maybe you just found them boring or unclear. Well, possibly because they're deliberately designed to challenge our belief systems and our expectations about movie life in the world at large. And so a few films I will show you this semester do just that. When watching such films, we need to be a bit more patient. The pleasure is less immediate and the process of identification and idealization are less easily engaged. Yes, the sound is so loud, you can barely hear me twice years in Because wouldn't have we loved to do that this summer? Again, idealization and identification, two key processes of films. So when we're thinking about those, can think of a question to consider. How are certain approaches to life and to our social environment expressed in cinema? As critical film goers, we can begin to discover the art in entertaining films as well as an entertainment value in films that are challenging. We can bring analysis to movies that define themselves as or against escapist fun. And so here are seven questions maybe seems like a lot, but not so much, to reflect and think about what you've been learning this first week. Of course, you can pause the video to uh, take note of them. And the rest of the slides, which I'll show in the video, um, we will discuss in class, but I'm leaving them up in here in case you want a preview of what's to come. So thanks a lot for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed my examples. And I look so much forward to seeing you in class, because as we know, cinema goers are the most joyful people. 
little bit of an interpretation of the study, but why not?